radiation. The other aspects of nanoparticles that also makes them very attractive, aside from you can tune the biological properties, the physical properties, is that you can also change the surface chemistry of these materials rather easily. So you can make the surface hydrophilic, you can put glass coating on the surface, different polymers, you can put different proteins on the surface, streptavidin, antibodies, you can put peptides, you can put uh, DNA on the surface. And so all these, these coating of the, the nanoparticles allows you, again, to manipulate its interaction of cells and manipulate how it's behaving within the cell. So there are other properties, and there's a, a longer list of other properties, um, and, and so I won't go through the entire list, but I just want to mention this one other property of most material, of nanoparticles. So then they tend to produce a stronger signal, as we observe with the uh, magnetic nanoparticles, um, and they're also more stable than the organic counterpart. So if you took a quantum dot that's mentioned in the previous talks and that was mentioned in this talk, so a quantum dot is 20 times brighter than the organic fluorophore, rhodamine 6G, but the other aspect that's really cool is that the signal doesn't get lost when you excite your sample. So here's an example in which you have a actin fibers in a cell that's labeled with a Alexa dye, and after you illuminate for 60 seconds, you lose your signal. If you take a quantum dot, after about 200 seconds, you still see your signal that's shown by the red. So again, if you're trying to track how a protein is moving, you're trying to track how a vesicle is moving, in a, in a fundamental biological study, you can use a quantum dot. So you can track how a protein is working at the single molecule level because it's bright enough, but also the fact that it, the signal is preserved, you, you, you'll be able to track a lot of biological processes for longer term. So these are the properties of materials. So how do you make these particular materials? So one of the, the, the analogies I like to make in terms of synthesis of nanomaterials is that if you can cook, you can make nanomaterials. So it's not that much uh, different than, than cooking except for the fact that you can't eat your nanomaterials, but you can actually see all these pretty properties of material. So I'm going to show an example of how we make our, our quantum dots. So the first thing we do is we, we take a surfactant called topo, trinoctophosphine oxide, we heat it to 350 degrees Celsius. Once we're at this temperature, we essentially inject cadmium and selenium um, atoms to this particular reactant or uh, stabilizing ligand. And within two seconds, you see the solution change from clear to light yellow. And when it changes to light yellow, you, you already start seeing formation of a nanomaterial. So in this case, it's a cadmium sunlight nanoparticle. The way you grow it is that you lower the temperature to 300 degrees Celsius and you let it simmer for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and so on. So the particles get bigger and bigger. Once you have the size that you want, you essentially uh, decrease the temperature to 270 degrees, and now you can inject another semiconductor, zinc sulfide, on the surface, which then protects the, or coats on the surface of the cadmium selenide. So again, a lot of the different materials, this is the general scheme that you use. You take a, react a surfactant, you heat it to a certain temperature, you inject your reactant, and then within a certain period of time, you essentially make your nanoparticle. And the nice thing, again, is that you can tune the particles properly. So in this case here, as I mentioned, within 30 seconds, you see blue emission. One minute, you see green emission. 25 minutes, you see yellow. And 30 minutes, you see red. Again, we're, we're making these things at 300 degrees Celsius, and all you do, have to do is you just have to let it cook for a certain period of time. If you want a different color emission, in this case, it's visible. If you want something near infrared, so something that's very useful for biological imaging, all you have to do now instead of using cadmium selenide, you dope it with a little bit of tellurium. So cadmium, selenium, and tellurium, all of a sudden now you see the emission starts shifting from the visible in the red around 630 nanometers all the way to 820 nanometers, again, with different growth time. So you can change the properties of the material by simply changing the, the time of uh, preparation and also by doping it or adding different types of atoms to the composition of the, 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 the nanoparticle. And here's a picture of some of the particles that we make in our lab. As you can see that you can make rod-shaped structures, you can make sphere-shaped structures, you can make triangle-shaped structures. So basically at the end of the day you can make nanoparticles ranging in size from one nanometer up to 100. Again, you can change all different shapes, rod, spheres, triangles. You can make tetrapods, you can make dumbbell shape, you can make rice shaped structures, and each of these shapes will have a certain unique properties associated with the material. So the beautiful aspect of nano at this point 
is that you can custom design the properties of a material. So again, if you come back to organic molecules, if you need uh, organic molecules with different properties, you may have to start off with a completely different synthesis each time. So if you need molecule A versus molecule B, it might take you 10 years or five years to make molecule B because the synthetic aspect could be very complicated. But the nice aspect of nano is, again, you want, to, you want a material with different properties, you just change the size, the shape, or you change the composition. And by changing these particular parameters, you change the properties, which then allows you to incorporate them into different types of application now. So it becomes a building block to build different devices um, using nanotechnology. So in terms of applications of nano, most of them, I would have to say, in this, in this particular point, um, in clinical phase, or have been approved by various health, health agencies, have been in cancer applications, have been in diagnostics, and have been microbicides. And one of the reasons why there's a huge focus in terms of cancer applications for nano is that the U.S. Uh, National Cancer Institute decided to emphasize nanotechnology for cancer in 1999-2000. So in 10 years, they put close to 1 billion U.S. dollars, which is, I guess is about 600 uh, million euro into this particular field. So that's where a lot of the activities, and people like me, uh, we were trained in an environment where we were trying to use nanoparticles in cancer, so naturally when we, we start our own program, this is what we're, in, we're working on, just because this is our, our background and expertise. But what we've seen the last four or five years now has been a focus in terms of combining nano with cardiovascular disease, looking at it for imaging plaques or for, for getting rid of plaques, for diabetes, for developing new types of vaccines, and also for pathology. So you can use nanoparticles as a better way to, to look at different types of molecules to do a multiplex screening. And the other aspect of nano that's very popular now is that nano is used as a research tool to study diseases. So 15 years ago, if you ask most biologists, clinicians what a quantum dot is, most biologists and clinicians will not know what a quantum dot is. But nowadays, most people know what a quantum dot is. They're commercially available. People are using it as a tool for research to look at, at proteins and, and, and DNA and other types of molecules. And most of the, and so what I hear listed is the nine most commonly used nanoparticles today. So you have gold particles, gold nanoshells, which I'll explain how they're used in a minute, iron oxide nanoparticles, micelles, liposomes, polymer nanospheres, dendromers, quantum dots, fullerenes, and carbon nanotubes. The top two sets of particles I've shown are in clinical trials or, or already approved and are used in patients. And these particular materials are mostly at the research phase at this point and will likely go through some clinical trials hopefully in the next five to ten years. So most of the nanomaterials you see in the literature, most of the nanomaterials that companies are making involves one of nine of these particular nanomaterials. And so I just want to start off by explaining how nanomaterials are used in the clinic. So one of the principal applications of nano, as I mentioned before, is in cancer applications. So the principle is the following. You take a patient, for example, in this patient with breast cancer, you inject a nanoparticle, and the nanoparticle is injected into the patient, it circulates around, and then essentially identifies or localizes within the tumor space, which is located here. If you take the nanoparticle and it's essentially a drug carrier, that particular care system brings it into the tumor cells and kills only the tumor cells. Again, this is very uh, theoretical. And what ends up happening is because the drug is protected, it doesn't get degraded because you can load a lot of the drug inside these nanoparticles. You don't have to inject such a high dose of your chemotherapeutic agent. So the, so, so the point of injecting less chemo and the fact that the chemo will not be exposed to healthy tissues that you have a reduction of side effects. Or if you put a contrast agent, again, an MRI contrast agent, or if you take a particle and put a PET imaging agent, uh, positron emission tomography or uh, MRI imaging, again, the nanoparticle exit carrier delivers that particular image agent into the tumor and allows for imaging. And if you can make a bright signal that comes from the tumor, essentially this allows you to, uh, for early detection, because a brighter signal allows you to detect less cells uh, and hopefully uh, less of the cells met metastasizing. So theoretically, it's expected that the nanoparticles will localize 100% of the tumor site and 0% in other organs. Again, reduction in, in signal 
increase in signal reduction of side effects. But in reality, this is not the case. And I'll explain why in a few slides from now. So usually it's about anywhere from 5 to 50 percent, depending on the nanoparticle system and depends on the, the tumor system that you're, you're working on. So here's just some examples of some of the um, early applications of these nano in cancer. So here's a study that's uh, nicely done by Frangioni and Bowindi, in which they're using quantum dots as a way to, uh, to assist uh, surgical resection. So this is a sentinel uh, lymph node uh, resection in which they take quantum dots injected into, uh, in this case it was a pig, but you can inject this into a patient. The quantum dot essentially localizes into the lymph nodes because they're glowing and, and fluorescent. It allows the surgeon to be able to visualize where the, the metastatic tumor is within the lymph node and then allows it to, to essentially cut and remove the tumor. So the, the point here is that the quantum are bright enough to allow you to visualize where the tumor is. And again, it helps the surgeon so that they're not cutting in the dark. They're allowed to, to cut by using light as a guide. Another example that's done by uh, Naomi Hallis and Jennifer Weston's group at Rice University in the U.S., which they took a nano shell. So these are glass particles that are coated with, uh, with gold. And these particles actually produces a lot of heat. So you can take these particles, inject them into a tumor, use a laser that uh, emits at uh, 700 nanometers. What you do is you excite these gold and you create a lot of localized heat. And so what you do now is you can actually burn off the tumor. Right? So you can deliver the right in the tumor, shoot a laser right at that point, generate a lot of heat, and that heat essentially burns off the tumor selectively. Here's another example from my group in which we took fluorescent nanoparticles, inject them into an animal, and you can see them localized in the tumor. Again, the major point of tumor detection or early detection is that you want to detect a few tumor cells that are starting to grow. So tumor is actually treatable if you can detect it early enough so you can cut and remove the cells. However, one of the problems with cancer is that once it starts moving the body, it becomes very difficult to find and at that point it's very difficult to treat. So you want to detect as soon as possible. Again, the brighter signals allows you to, to do that. So in terms of some clinical uh, applications I've mentioned before, most of the applications in the clinic at this point for nano that's been approved has been in cancer applications as MRI contrast agent, uh, as cancer therapeutics. So you see organic nanoparticles are used in this uh, particular uh, applications. Iron oxide that is used for um, MRI contrast, gold nanoparticles for cancer therapeutics, and there's a few companies developing these particular materials for in vitro diagnostics. And again, the quantum dots are mostly used for research at this point. And the second aspect of applications in, in diagnostics, the, the previous speaker has already mentioned. So one of the most popular uh, form of uh, nanotechnology that's being used are in uh, dipstick tests. So this is the common pregnancy test. So you can buy this anywhere in which you can see the, uh, the, the goal that's uh, labeling the size. So essentially what you have here is, uh, is you have, uh, you have gold and you have an antibody that's labeled one region of the, um, the, the stick. Uh, if it's a pregnancy test, uh, your wife pees on the stick essentially and it causes a capillary flow to move the complex from one part of the stick to the next. And so there's an antibody in another region. So the, the molecule that is being expressed by, by my wife, if she's pregnant, uh, joins the gold particle with the antibody. And this is where, where the color is observed. So usually you see a red color if it's a low concentration. But you, most of the time you see a blue color because there's so much gold that's on this layer. So the gold is coupling with each other. And then again, the color shifts from red to, to blue because of that. So that's one application. So oh, this slide did not come through. It's one problem with uh, converting from Mac to PC. Um, let's see the next one. Oh, okay. So one of the other applications of nanoparticles that you can use, I'm just going to use next as an example, is for multiplex diagnostics. So one of the things that has happened in the last, um, the last uh, 10 years from a systems biology approach is that diseases originate from molecular changes. So usually when diseases start and progresses and grows, what ends up happening is it's not just one protein that's involved in the process. Usually it's a series of proteins. So what you can do is essentially you can try to measure all those proteins simultaneously. This improves the accuracy of diagnosis because if you just use one marker to measure, you may be, you miss the signal. So if you use three or four, this will increase the, the chance of detecting the disease. So in this example here, what I show here is that you take little beads, 
the beads are essentially loaded with different colored quantum dots. So in this bead here is loaded with a green quantum dot. This one is loaded with less green quantum dot. This is even less. This one has yellow quantum dots. And this uh, different signal has different colors of different colors of of uh, red and yellow and green quantum dots in them. So from our eyes, we may not be able to see the difference between, let's say, this red and this red. But if you measure the optical signal, these are very two very different beads. Okay. So in this example here, what I show is a hundred different color beads that you can make. So let's say we use it for genetic detection. So what we do here is we can take this bead, label it with a capture oligo nucleotide that can recognize, let's say, gene A. So this one, capture molecule 2, that recognizes gene 2. So each of these different colors now can identify a different gene. So if you place a hundred different beads into a centrifuge 2, and each bead essentially has a different color that can capture a different gene, you can actually measure a hundred different genes simultaneously. So we've done this in, in an experiment, this is what this figure would show, is that we show that we can detect nine different genetic sequences for different infectious disease. So we did HIV, we did malaria, syphilis, so these are all blood-borne viruses. So within these particular beads, we put nine different color beads all in a vial, added our serum or a plasma that was about 20 microliter, shook, shook it up for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we can measure the signal using a flow cytometer, or we're trying to develop a microfluidic system, so we're actually trying to incorporate these, these barcodes, these are called barcodes, into a diagnostic device the size of an iPhone. So we're working toward a small scale diagnostic system. And what's really cool about this assay that we did was that for genetic detection, in 15 to 20 minutes, we can detect all nine of these different genes simultaneously. For proteins, it takes about an hour to two. So for proteins, it's a much slower reaction than genes. But the nice thing, again, is that you can detect a large amount of, uh, of different molecules simultaneously rap and rapidly. And our sensitivity right now is about 100 times worse than PCR. So we're working on now different, different amplification strategy to try to compete directly with PCR. And again, the advantage here versus PCR is that we can detect a lot of, lot of genetic sequences simultaneously, while PCR, you're limited to detecting one sequence at a time. Um, and this also allows you to do uh, real-time detection. And the other nice thing about this is that when, our, when we're doing our analysis, we only need 20 to 30 microliter samples. So you don't need a lot of large amount of samples to, to do this assay. So the other concern, so these are some of the applications of, of nanomaterials. But the other concern about nano at this point, is, as the previous speaker mentioned, is that there, there's issues of toxicity of nanoparticles. And so, and the reason, there's three major reasons why nano can cause toxicity. So one is that a lot of nanomaterials, not all, are made with um, atoms with known toxicity. So in the example I showed before, they're made with cadmium, or they're made with mercury or gold. And so when these uh, materials are being metabolized, they can poison cells because of the metal, right? So metal has been well known to have uh, toxicity. So if they break down, um, your cells and your organs be exposed to metal. The other aspect is, you know, it's very nice that these nanoparticles can enter cells and tissues, but the other problem is because they can enter cells and tissues, they can enter vital organs. So now you're carrying metal into vital organs that can also potentially be toxic. So if you have a larger structure, they may not be able to access certain organs, so it's non toxic in that manner. But in nanoparticles, it's a good and a bad thing. The other aspect that's also challenging is that the properties of the nanoparticles are related to size and shape. So let's say these particles get into macrophage cells, and the macrophages are essentially degrading these particles. What ends up happening now is that when it degrades a particle, it changes the properties of the particles. So it's not clear how it changes and how that affects the properties of the, the, the molecules they're interacting with. So most of the claims of toxicity nowadays involve cell studies. So in this example here, we show that cadmium cell like quantum dots when it starts breaking down, it starts changing the phenotype of cells, so healthy cells, unhealthy cells. So most of the claims of toxicity at this point are based on cell studies. If you look at, ah, it doesn't show up again. If you look at in vivo, this is an example of pathology. So in an animal study, even though they're, they're toxic to cells in vitro, but in animals, the pathology of a normal animal and an animal injected with these particles are very similar. So they're not necessarily toxic in an animal system. 
and we did a blood component analysis, again, comparing the normal, the uninjected versus injected quantum dots, and we don't see a lot of difference. And in the liver enzyme, which you can use as a way to measure toxicity, we do not see a lot of difference. So what I can say at this point is that there is a difference between the toxicity from a cell perspective versus an animal perspective. And most of the clinical studies that have been done have shown that nanoparticles do not actually have any unique toxic response. So these are, are from these uh, particles that's gone through clinical trials. So if you look at the toxicity data, not that much different from, from what you normally see associated with the, the particular uh, drug that is being incorporated. So the key aspect here is really the dose makes the poison, right? So how much particles and how long you get exposed to particles essentially determines whether they're toxic or not. And one of the concerning effects of nanomaterials is that most of the nanomaterials do not actually get cleared from the body. If they do not get cleared, there's a long-term cumulative uh, aspect of toxicity. So that, that becomes an issue at this point, is how do you actually design these materials so that they get clear? So if they get clear, then there's less issues of toxicity. But again, it's more of an engineering challenge, but the, the toxicology data is actually guiding us in terms of how to design these systems. So basically, toxicology research is rapidly growing, and researchers are trying to correlate toxicity with nanopore properties. So it's going to be very important to understand nanotoxicity in order to translate nanotechnologies from the academic lab to the bedside. So right now, in terms of current state of research, you see lots of research that's happening, but very few clinical products at this point. So there's a potential, if you can flip this around, and all of a sudden now you can treat a variety of different types of cancer very easily by, by using nanoparticles, but it has to make that, that switch. And the field itself, as, as uh, mentioned earlier, it evolves from a lot of material scientists, chemists, and physicists start being applied in biology, and now it's starting to move in the clinic. And you can see the number of publications in the fields are starting to grow in exponential fashion. So there's a lot of emphasis in terms of nano development. Okay, this didn't show up as well. Um, but what you see here is that countries are heavily investing in nano research. So Singapore, for example, if you look at the publications that are coming out of Singapore, 16% of all papers that comes out from Singapore are on nano related. So it could be medicine, biology, or electronics, or computer applications. So in France right now, it's about 6.62% of all publications. Again, biology, medicine, electronics. So I can say in Singapore, very little has come from medicine, but mostly it's from electronics. South Korea as well. So Samsung is hugely investing in nano, but from an electronic perspective. So some of the challenges. So the delivery of nanoparticles into disease tissue is typically low, so that's something that needs to be improved upon. The second aspect is that animals versus human models. So a lot of work are now being done in animals, but it's starting to be more done more in, in human clinical trials. So there's always sometimes a discrepancy between animal results and human results. Toxicity of particles limit their applications, and in vitro diagnostics, it's the biomarkers and non-specific binding that's limiting. So even though you can make a thousand different barcodes, you have to find a thousand different biomarkers to match the barcodes. And I just want to also mention the fact that uh, nano can span the entire range, so from chemists, material scientists, all the way to policymakers. So it goes into many different fields at this point, so it's not limited to clinicians, chemists, or biologists. It really requires an interdisciplinary research focus. Um, I'm going to make some quick take-home points, and then I'll finish up there. So particles in the size range of 1 to 1 nanometers have unique properties. And I apologize for this. So this is a problem with the Mac to PC interface. It actually, it should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It showed up as 1, 1, 1, 1. So nanoparticles can be used to improve diagnosis of disease through better imaging contrast and greater sensitivity. Nanoparticles can protect drugs from degradation, changes the potency of a drug, or improve their pharmacokinetic behavior. Nanoparticles can improve delivery efficiency of a drug or contrast agent. Nanoparticles can be used as a therapeutic or contrast agents. And my last point is that the, the future of nano, so what we've shown here now is only one type of nanomaterial. So these are single, multi, multi, single modality nanoparticles. So a lot of people are starting to work on what are called diagnostic agents, multifunctional nanostructures, or smart nanosystems. So what this is basically is you take a nanoparticle that can act as an imaging agent, you put a sensor on the uh, surface of the particle, you can put a therapeutic agent also on the particle. 
So then you can also put a targeting agent. So these particles act as both an imaging agent and a therapeutic agent. So the idea here is you take these particles, inject it into patients. If it senses the disease, it will start releasing the drug to, to accommodate for the disease. So here's an example of some of the particle designs that we've made in my lab, which we're starting to now develop multi-chamber delivery systems. So you can, again, put one in an imaging uh, agent, another uh, a drug agent um, to be able to, to treat diseases. Or you can put different types of drugs. So you can put in different chambers different numbers of drugs. Again, you can release drug A at one time, drug B, and another time, drug C, and at different times. So you can control the release. And again, this is uh, the Mac to uh, PC interface. You see the, the pictures got flipped. So this is uh, one of the problems with, with using a Mac for a PC. So um, irrespective of that, um, so, um, so, so my research group, all the work that I've shown is basically from, uh, from the last 10 years of work from a variety of uh, different graduate students. Um, and as I said, my, my lab is built from people from different backgrounds. So as I said, I'm a chemist by training. So my lab has uh, MDs, so I have an orthopedic surgeon, so she's come back for a PhD. I have a material scientist, uh, Vahid, which I can't read upside down, or look upside down. But Vahid Vayashi is a material scientist. I have a few chemists, a couple of biologists in the lab. So my lab itself is constructed from people of various backgrounds, and that's the only way to, to make this uh, particular field work. It doesn't work if you have all chemists, all biologists, all clinicians. It really requires an interdisciplinary effort and requires people to think in different fields to be able to get this to work. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.